Hi, folks. I am Lauren. Uh, I'm on the developer relations team at Temporal. And welcome to the August monthly Temporal Meetup. Um, I uh, We have a couple of talks today. The first is uh, on the .NET SDK, and the second is um, on uh, deploying Temporal Server. And uh, I'll get started by, by sharing about Replay. Uh, so Replay is an annual conference that we hold. Um, on uh, backend software or uh, software engineering in general, um, and and this year we most of the talks will be on uh, temporal. So, uh, folks from different companies talking about how they uh, use temporal, and then also some product announcements from us from birds of a feather discussions. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about that in case anyone's interested in joining us. Let's see. Here's the website is temporal.io slash replay uh september 12th through 14th in seattle uh we have a list of speakers from stripe uh aws microsoft hashicorp datadog grab uh here's the agenda day zero is uh tuesday that has workshops in a uh, full, full day in, in go or java or typescript uh for if you're a beginner uh, temporal dev, or you have a colleague you want to get up to speed, you can send them here. Um, we also have a hackathon on day one or day zero that I'll, that I'll talk to talk about later. It's an alternative to the workshops. And then day one and two are um, talks, and uh, you can click on the plus to see an abstract of each talk. I'm looking forward to this one from Paul. And uh, it's in a new new venue. We have a big, bigger crowd than last year. Uh, here's where you get tickets and uh, the you can either do a workshop uh, combination ticket or you can get an individual ticket and add on a hackathon if you'd like. Uh, and then uh, some some talks from last year and then a FAQ, which includes uh, last year you had an awesome after party. Will there be one? Yes, there will be. Uh, how do I convince my boss? Uh, there's a justify your trip letter here. Uh, and the the theme this year is like something like uh, space skeleton monster astronaut. Uh, my 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 guess is that it's like workflows are invincible. So if you kill one, another uh, kill a worker, another worker will come out of the the foreign landscape ground to continue running your workflow. Uh, so workflows are forever. Uh, the information about the hackathon is on our blog. Um, if you scroll down to here, announcing Hackathon at Replay, we have a schedule. Um, I will be there and a couple of my colleagues uh, helping to answer any questions, uh, helping you with your, with your Hackathon projects. There are some rules and different categories for prizes. I think eight, eight prizes in total. Um, so that's the Hackathon. That's Replay. Uh, and I guess we'll get started with Chad. So Chad is a language run, runtime engineer on the SDK team, and he uh, used to maintain the Go SDK, maybe he still helps with that. And he built the uh, Python and .NET SDKs on top of the the Rust core. And the .NET SDK, .NET SDK uh, recently hit beta. Uh, so he'll be sharing uh, about that SDK. Go ahead, chat. Will you stop sharing your screen so I can share mine? Yep. There we go. All right. So first of all, I want to apologize. I know my microphone echoes. I've I've been told I, I am I am remedying it, just not today. So I'm just gonna so with the few minutes I have here, I'm just gonna go over what we built with regard to .NET and then uh, field some questions. This is just a high level overview of what the .NET SDK is and does and what makes it unique compared to other SDKs. Um, so let's get started. So um, I'm literally just going to walk down the README because the README really is the best guide for what it is and what it currently does. So um, the, the .NET SDK, like Lauren mentioned, were, is backed by the Rust core. And so we had to write a Rust bridge layer and everything. But from the user's perspective, it leverages and is as native .NET and C Sharp as you can imagine. So you install it as you might normally. And here's just a quick taste of what a couple of the features look like. So here is how implementing an activity works. It's just a method, just like uh, 
any of our other SDKs. There's nothing really special there. You uh, annotate it via a .NET attribute. Uh, similarly, nothing too special about the workflow side. We'll get into some of the quirks about how workflow asynchrony works. But basically, you have a workflow class, and you have a workflow entry point or primary method, and you can do things like execute an activity. Note that you can still use um, async in a way, .NET tasks, and also note that we take uh, we use uh, .NET Lambda expressions in order to make type safe invocations to activities, child workflows, things like that, which greatly help how the the how the SDK feels to authors. So that's a very simple workflow, and it is very simple to also run a worker. It is as you might expect, um, straightforward with uh, starting a daemon, and I'll get into some of the extra uh, dependency injection features we've added. And executing a workflow also uses Lambda expressions to be type safe. So you create a client, execute a workflow, can pass the argument, and we actually serialize that like we do with all of our other SDKs. So it's very simple, it's very straightforward. What, um, if you were to categorize the .NET SDK compared to the others, you would probably say it is um it is it is tied for the most type safe with TypeScript and kind of even Python as weird as that sounds, but it is probably one of the highest performing SDKs uh, alongside of Go and Java. Obviously, since .NET is uh, is compiled to an intermediate language, it's a lot faster. And it is in some ways going to be better performing than Java because it doesn't have to use threads, right? It uses cooperative coroutines and .NET, .NET task framework. So basically think of it as like, and, and we still need some benchmarks to bear this out, but think of it as, as amongst our highest performing and amongst our most type safe, which may be the only SDK we have that fits in both of those categories. So it's kind of nice. Okay, so... Um, the first feature of every SDK, the most obvious feature, and the feature that everybody likes to use is the client, right? So this uh, this is an example of connecting a client and then invoking a workflow. There's really not much to it. There's a lot of advanced pieces in here that we could get into, but suffice to say, client connection, which, uh, which actually does use the underlying Rust core. So um, those of you who may be aware are our Communication to the server is over gRPC. This actually uses the Rust gRPC library, not the .NET gRPC library, which actually has a lot of benefits. Um, and this, so this starts a workflow. And again, this makes, uh, this uses type safe Lambda expressions. So, uh, so you might think that you're actually invoking a function on the workflow, like run async here, but you're not. This in .NET, what happens is, is this is actually um, converted to an AST expression, a type safe AST expression that we can then extract. So I actually uh, extract the workflow that you're using, serialize the method arguments and send those to the server. So it'll look like you're just making a call. And for those of you that are familiar with the Java SDK, it does it kind of similarly, except that it's a little bit more powerful because it's not as confusing as the proxy object. You can still provide options here and things including these two options, ID and task queue, which are of course required. And then here's how you get result. We have extension methods that combine start and get results. So you can just call execute workflow. Very simple, very straightforward, very type safe. And then there's, uh, we get into some details about like if you need to use TLS, such as if you're using our cloud and um, what the workflow handle is. For those that are in .NET and are using dependency injection, we do offer a dependency injection extension that allows you to inject uh, multiple things to create a client and inject clients to create workers, but we'll get to that later. .NET data conversion, like all of our SDK data conversions, is tailored to the language. So we use the regular system text JSON um, namespace for most of the serialization, but we also support protos, and others. Um, if you're familiar with the data conversion from other languages, it actually is very similar, just with a little bit of a .NET feel. But so long as you make a, a record or a class that is JSON serializable, it will work in, in both directions. 
And then this shows how, because in .NET, the JSON serialization does field name by default, which is old Pascal case with a capital letter. And the rest of the JSON world obviously is camel case with the lower initial uh, character. So this shows just how in .NET you can make it camel case. So uh, the main, so if you're not using it for the client, you're using Temporal for its worker. Uh, the worker runs all workflows and activities. It is like the worker in any other SDK. Um, you simply instantiate it with the activities and workflows that you want on the task queue that the worker represents, and then you run it. Uh, there's really not much to it. It leverages cancellation tokens as most things do. This is an example of a cancellation token for, you know, control seeing out of a out of a binary. But the same approach exists everywhere. So, but a lot of people, the way that they um, invoke .NET daemons and uh, long running .NET applications is via um, what .NET calls generic hosts. So we have an extension, the extensions, the hosting extension that allows you to very simply, and for those of y'all using Java, this may feel like Spring Boot. And for those of y'all using any other dependency injection container may be familiar with this, or if you're using ASP.NET, you may be familiar. But this, is, this allows you to create a very simple worker with workflows that is dependency injection supported, including the activities, which there is no such thing as dependency injection in a workflow because it makes little sense. Workflows have to be self-contained. However, for an activity, it makes perfect sense. You may want to dependency inject your Postgres client. Um, this, so this allows workers and all the activities to support dependency injection, which is... Uh, which is, a, which is a nice and very common feature in .NET. So you can see we already have extensions in the SDK. This one, and we also have the open telemetry extension uh, because we don't want to force you to take a dependency you don't need. So on to workflows. Uh, this is a more advanced form of a workflow. You can see that uh, it is uh, has the .NET attribute for workflow and the entry point. And you can see that we're just in a big loop that are invoking an activity. We can log, we can wait on conditions, which actually is a Lambda invoked every event loop. Um, we can accept signals, um, which must be asynchronous um, methods. And we can do queries, which must be synchronous methods. And they, or they can actually be put on a getter of a, uh, of a property, which is kind of neat. We will be soon supporting workflow update, which will be asynchronous methods that can return a result. But for right now, all we have is task that doesn't allow a result and query that doesn't allow tasks. It must be synchronous because queries are read-only and can have no side effects. Um, and then we get into the, and then we have a concept of dynamic workflows and activities, or, um, and I won't get into it much, but .NET does support, like Java supports, falling through to a catch-all workflow, catch-all activity, a catch-all signal, a catch-all query. Um, and then this gets into a little bit of the concerns on workflow inheritance. So you understand the decisions we made to avoid uh, the diamond problem for the most part. So running a workflow, we've already discussed how to start a workflow, right? It's very straightforward. Here's how to send a signal. Look how nice and easy and type safe this is. It literally is calling the function with the argument in a lambda. Uh, that's about as uh, clean as it looks across any SDK at this point. Um, same type of deal here. Here's signaling another. Here's what it looks like to query. You can see how very simple that is. All right. So, um, and then it, this just gets into some utilities, timers, and things like that. So here's the interesting thing. Every time we develop an SDK, you have some common temporal concepts, but the primary temporal concept that is unique per language is how workflows handle asynchrony. In every language, temporal must develop cooperative coroutines that are deterministic. We can't use random threading for obvious reasons. Different SDKs handle this differently. In Go, we can't hook into their scheduler, so we have our own homemade coroutine implementation. Same with Java, even though it's backed by a thread pool, only one thread can run at a time. Uh, TypeScript and Python both have built-in cooperative deterministic coroutine uh, schedulers that we can hook into, so it actually looks language native. .NET has half that and half the Java-ish approach. In .NET, they have a task framework, but 
they blur the line between coroutines and threads. And they make it very, and, and so what we can do, like we did in Python and others, is make a custom scheduler. But in .NET, making a custom scheduler is not that easy. Uh, or actually, it's easy, but it's not easy to guarantee that users' tasks will run on your custom scheduler. So we have a little helper that tries to catch when you don't. And we can't really control timers. So if you called like task.delay, which for those of y'all not familiar with .NET is basically asleep, if you call that, we will break because that's using the system timer, which is non-deterministic. But if you use workflow.delay, it'll work. However, if you create a regular .NET task and run it with, uh, with some calls that do support a custom scheduler in the workflow, it'll work just fine. And it'll look just like the task framework. But some calls in .NET use the system scheduler and either do that by default or will not even allow you to override it. And we will fail when we detect those two. Unfortunately, right now we only fail at runtime, but we are building a static analyzer, which those of y'all are familiar with .NET know that is very common in .NET. We are building a static analyzer to help with that. In the meantime, just know that there are some, uh, some caveats when you develop asynchronously inside of a workflow. Like don't use task run, use task start new. Don't use configure await false, but you can use configure await true. Um, these quirks may seem a little bit annoying, but it's actually pretty common when writing deterministic asynchronous code in .NET. If you've used Orleans, or if you've used the Azure Durable Task Framework, they have the same type of documentation I do here. Maybe not as in depth, but same problems, same concerns, same approach. .NET did just, uh, did just drop a time provider API. So once that hits, which will probably be .NET 9, once that hits and is reasonably stable, we'll hook into that. So you will be able to use task.delay and regular timeouts so long as they are duration-based and not deadline-based. Deadline-based timeouts, obviously not deterministic, at least unless you convert them to durations right there. Um, so also it should be noted that .NET has really a lot of rules around analyzers of how you need to write code. Workflows violate that a little bit. So this is a set for those of y'all that are using editor config in your Visual Studio or whatever. This is a set of logic of things that you can do in a workflow that you probably shouldn't do in normal code, uh, such as marking things as asynchronous, uh, uh, doing getters uh, and setters manually instead of with properties because we have to be able to attribute them, especially for signals. So there's a few things there. I won't go over it all in detail. And then, of course, we have all the testing stuff that you're familiar with. If you're familiar with TypeScript or Python, you have a time skipping test server. You have uh, that automatically time skips. You also have a, the local embedded full implementation of temporal server if you want that as well. And then we have the replayer, just like any of our SDKs. Replayer, often overlooked feature. Please use it to make sure that you are comfortable in alterations and determinism inside of your workflows. And then you have activities. There's not really too much to say here. It can get complicated in Python and others on whether it's using thread, whether it's using task, blah, blah, blah. In .NET, we make it as straightforward as we can. We run your function. If it happens to run a turn of task, we'll await on that task as well. Um, there is heart beating. Uh, there, the cancellation token is on there. It's all the things that if you've ever developed a .NET in a .NET job world or something like that, you'll be familiar with all this. There's there's almost nothing to it. So that's, uh, and then I mentioned before that we do support dependency injection via the extension. The activity context, like in all languages, has the info, the logger, cancellation token, and things like that. We do support graceful shutdown, like most of the workers and most of the SDKs do, so we'll cancel the activity. And then, of course, we have a, uh, a testing framework. And then finally, there's the open uh, the open telemetry extension, which if all you have to do is, and this is uh, using open telemetry APIs, is put this interceptor on your client, and we will automatically be sending spans that look like the workflow all the way to uh, all the way to your open telemetry endpoint. There are some quirks about how spans are recorded and traced across processes. Um, Come find me at replay and I'll I'll talk your head off on it. But basically, uh, open telemetry doesn't support resuming spans, but type uh, but temporal res uh, supports resuming code. So there's a little bit 
of caveats there. Um, that is basically it. There's some details about how to build it yourself and how to regen protos if you're a contributor and stuff. But it's pretty straightforward. It, in in my opinion, my very very biased opinion, it is our it is one of the cleanest implementations because of how many ways to do things .NET has to make it to make it look very simple from an author and reader's perspective. So with that, I'll finish a couple minutes early, but I will open it up to questions. And feel free to drop it in the chat uh, or unmute and ask uh, the question yourself. I, I, I'd like to start with one, which is you, you said uh, you recommended using a replayer. What's a replayer? Sure. So um, when let's, let's start, let's see if I can do this in, in like uh, my one minute replayer brief. So when you run a worker and it's half done with the workflow and you kill that worker, or that worker crashes, how does that workflow resume? It resumes in temporal by replaying all the steps that we've already seen before. How does it replay all those steps we've already seen before? By using the replayer. And how does and when does non-determinism happen? When on replay, it takes a different path than it originally took, and we can detect that difference. You can use a replayer to help prevent these scenarios. Essentially, it, what a lot of companies do is they have it built into their workflow execution that after the workflow is done, they'll automatically go grab the history and replay it. So what a replayer is, is it takes existing workflow history and without using a network connection or anything, runs the uh, workflow with the existing history to ensure that uh, there are no non-deterministic code paths that didn't happen originally. And again, that's 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 brushing over some of the details, which you can see in docs, but everybody should be doing this, especially on code changes. That way, you know, if your code alterations are safe with past executions. So it looks like Austin asks, uh, yeah, so I got the time abstraction wrong. It looks like they're gonna land it in .NET 8, so even better. Uh, the diamond problem, uh, Maya asks, I suppose, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, what Maya asks is, what is the diamond problem? Uh, this is a general problem in object-oriented languages that have single inheritance. It's basically how to know what the what the true uh, what what the true inherited uh, method is that the end user wants to call. And .NET has some confusing things with override and new and such. In order to avoid confusion with code readers, we actually re require some of our attributes to be on the final declared piece. And so no inherited attributes, but also no inherited workflow entry points. If you have a workflow and it is the workflow you are registering, it has to have a declared entry point, even if it's just calling its base class with a one-liner. Otherwise, people can people get very confused on following where the actual entry point of the workflow is. And I say entry point, but it's the primary function that the workflow runs. So we really, we disallow you hiding that. Where can I read more sample code about uh, using sure. .NET? So uh, the, at the top of the readme, there's a few links. One of those links is the samples. And the samples, uh, and we can always use contributions for more samples. But right now, we have this set of samples. Actually, I'll show you here. Um, and this shows you how to do various various common things in .NET. And this is at temporal.io samples.net repo, as opposed to the sdk.net repo. You said that uh, the Donna SDK is like top tier for type safety and probably performance. Uh, are there any reasons, let's say uh, my team and I know all of the languages well that Temporal has uh, uh, runtimes in, any reasons to use a different one? The, different than .NET? Right, right. Um, really it's where your activities live is really what it comes down to. Um, people don't bring their workflows from outside of Temporal. Most of the time, you need to author your workflows knowing you're within a workflow. So if you're approaching Temporal, if you have a lot of code in a certain language, you probably want to stay in that language for your activity worker. Um, for the most part, the language difference won't matter enough to you on performance-wise. But let's say, hypothetically, all things were equal, which they never are. But let's say all things were equal and you are start coming to Temporal without a drop of code written yet. Yes, there are benefits to some SDKs over others. 
Uh, the Go SDK is probably the highest performing, lowest memory footprint. Um, the Java SDK has had a lot of benchmarking work to make it also one of the highest performing, but it has a little bit higher per, uh, uh, footprint due to use of OS threads and just some of the JVM overhead in general. Uh, Python in, in uh, Python is obviously going to be slower because, you know, welcome to Python. And uh, in the TypeScript world, you have great typing, amongst the best typing. And TypeScript has the best sandboxing by far of any of our SDKs. I would probably reach for TypeScript first, to be honest. You get so much safety, so much benefit, um, but there are, uh, but the .NET world offers a lot, a lot of benefits for people that have code already in .NET or are familiar with C Sharp and want the strong, uh, the strong typing and compile time benefits that .NET brings. What do you mean by? Uh... TypeScript has the best uh, sandboxing. What's a sandbox? Sure. So .NET, uh, so workflows have to be deterministic, which means they can't be making network calls or writing to disks or asking about the system time or things like that. Um, in Go and Java and .NET, we have not found a good way to sandbox the runtime. There are a gazillion approaches. I have an entire talk on YouTube called Ensuring Deterministic Runtimes in different and modern languages that y'all can read. Uh, or watch, and but suffice to say, TypeScript, uh, so Python, we have hacked one, but you can still get around it. Uh, TypeScript, more specifically JavaScript, due to the fact that it is an inherently sandboxed runtime most of the time anyways, is very easy to sandbox for these purposes. Also with its tiny little standard library that doesn't reach out and do those things, it is very easy to sandbox. So we just use a, a, a a V8 sandbox to run things in TypeScript, which has so many safety benefits if, uh, to keep you from making mistakes. Question from Austin in the chat. Yeah, I, I think I addressed that when I got the uh, .NET 8 versus 9 wrong. Um, oh, besides task schedulers and determinism, what else was challenging to implement for the SDK? The Rust bridge. So in TypeScript, if you use uh, Node.js and Rust together, they have a nice library called Neon that helps you out and, and bridges that gap because you don't want to deal with a bunch of unsafe Rust by yourself. Uh, and then in Python, they got Pio3, which is very nice and, 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 and bridges the gap, captures the GIL, things like that. In .NET, there is not a good one. So I basically had to write a C library and use it via pinvoke. So yes, I am deep down in the weeds of unsafe rust, but luckily I've done it a lot before and I trust I'm I trust myself when it comes to freeing free memory and manual allocation and things like that. From a testing perspective, any known gaps or challenges that can't easily be tested when consuming the SDK? Uh no, there is not really con uh, specific to .NET that aren't that isn't uh, that doesn't apply to any other SDKs. Um, it, it's a full featured SDK. In fact, it has more features than some other SDKs. There's and there's very little except for new experimental features that is not in the .NET SDK that is another SDK. So it's is very full featured. Any last questions for chat? All right, thanks so much, Chad. Um, I, I I learned some stuff, and uh, I think it's an awesome SDK. And thank you for building it. Um, next up, we have Bavesh. Bavesh is an engineer at Wednesday Solutions, which is a, a consultancy that I think uh, builds applications with uh, Temporal. And he'll talk about uh, how they do uh, server deployment. Sure. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I'll just quickly share my screen. Let me know when everything is good. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, hello everyone. Like, good morning, and thank you for taking your time to join us in this session. Like, in the next twenty-five minutes, we'll just go over the why, like how, and the DIY toolkit uh, that we use to deploy Temporal on ECS, and how we can leverage the AWS ecosystem. So before we start off, uh, a quick intro about me. 
So my name is Bhavesh Pawar and I work as a senior software engineer at Wednesday Solutions. I've worked on various technologies starting from Kotlin, Flutter, React, Java, and Golang. And one thing I like about Wednesday is that we love giving back. We maintain a large number of uh, open source initiatives loved by the community and are also contributors to the projects like AWS Amplify, SQLize, and have contributed to building the serverless ecosystem. We were early adopters of the cloud native and we doubled down on AWS ECS. In fact, in the AWS Copilot Guides and Resources section, references are content. In one of our interviews, workflow management was necessity. And we know, like as any 10 year old does, temporal is best. So however, running temporal on ECS was not documented. So instead of complaining, in true Wednesday fashion, we got to work. Oh, I just stopped that, I guess. Yeah. And fast forward to 2023, here we are talking about temporal, how to run temporal on ECS and that too on the temporal community webinar. Thank you. Like, thank you for having me here. And like, once again, thank you for joining in. So let's see what we will cover in this session and what you can expect to take home post this session. So we'll have a quickly, quick look at the dynamic door that is the temporal and ECS. We will then talk more about it. And then when, as we talk about it, we'll see how the system will look like when we have it deployed in ECS. Basically, we'll look at the architecture diagram. Talking about the deployments, we will then look into the toolkit that we have and how does it help in making life easy. Then we'll go around looking for what is next when you are on ECS and how you can ship to production. Along with that, we will see a demo of load testing and how things scale up and scale down. And then we will see how to make the use of AWS ecosystem. I'm confident that by the end of this session, you'll have a comprehensive understanding like how, of like how to deploy temporary on ECS and build powerful applications together. Without a further ado, let's get started. So talking about the dynamic duo. So as you are all familiar with Tempura and its efficiency in doing what it is supposed to do, hands down. But what about ECS? ECS is an elastic container service. ECS allows you to run your applications in a small isolated unit. They're called as containers and which are easier to like develop, deploy and scale. When we are talking about ECS, let's not forget about the best buddy that ECS could ever have. And that is the AWS Copilot. So if you haven't heard of AWS Copilot, it is a CLI tool that takes care of setting up everything that you need to get your application running on ECS. This is what we have like used in our toolkit also. So the entire toolkit is built based on the AWS Copilot. Now that we know why ECS and how, it is, how easy it is to get rolling with ECS, let's talk about some challenges that we faced, uh, faced while we initially tried deploying uh, Temporal on ECS. So as you know, right, Temporal needs a few things to get started with. We will see about them in detail, like in upcoming slides. But when we do things manually, it can be a one-time effort to get temporal upon ECS. But now imagine that you have like multiple environments or, or there's some use case where you need to have multiple service, uh, like multiple temporal service for some reason. And doing that manually will take a lot of time. And even automating that was not a straightforward job. Well, what was the reason for it? The reason was synchronization. Synchronization is the main challenge when it comes up to getting all the services up and running that are required by Temporal to work. So as we discussed about synchronization and the challenges, let us see how the ideal uh, flow looks like before into directly going to the architecture. So let's say to access the Temporal UI or to see your workflows on the Temporal UI, right? You need to have the, the Temporal needs to have the underlying services to be in place. So what do, what do I mean by underlying services? So underlying database needs to be ready. It should be running and also the schema and migration setup should be in place. Along with the database, there's another component called as Elasticsearch that needs to be running and the schema and index setup needs to be in place. When running Temporal locally, when you use Docker Compose or you, uh, we can observe that five to six Docker images are launched and the Temporal server image then performs its duty uh, of waiting for the services to start and then initializing them. However, this does not occur like out of the box with ECS. Coming back to AWS or ECS, Let's see how we can set this up using the AWS way. So in the architecture diagram, you, you might be seeing that we are using AWS RDS for the database purpose, which will be used by the temporal service that is residing on the ECS. We will then use AWS open search in the place of Elasticsearch. Now, what is open search? So open search is nothing but a fork version of Elasticsearch. And this is the reason behind it is key. Uh, the Elasticsearch is no longer open source. That's the reason why AWS came up with open search. 
you can you can also see aws cloudwatch in the architecture diagram so we will be using cloudwatch to keep an eye on the cluster and report back if something is not happening properly or the way it should have like way it should be at the end everything is inside one single vpc so that they can communicate with each other and no one from the outside can interfere unless you want them to talking about how things are deployed and how the architecture will look like we will now see how to go like how to get there you have two ways to reach there one is the harder and the other is the easy one hard one is to block your calendars for next few hours and then start going through the documentations and follow each and every step and finally wait for the things to be in place and just in case i hope you don't land here but just in case if you miss some of the step let's say an ideal example would be uh, your inbound and outbound rule in the security group is missing some entry then welcome to the trap now you have a few more hours of debugging stress eating and hoping things to work this is a scary scenario let's talk about the easy part we know how it feels to be in the scary scenario that we just discussed but don't worry we have got you covered so drum rolls please so on the screen uh, you see a qr code to the temporal ecs toolkit you can use your mobile phone to scan this and you'll have the you'll, you'll be redirected to the github uh, where we have this repository present so this uh, toolkit right it does all the work that we have discussed in just one single click and that's it this tool is so amazing that it didn't even took me like few seconds to explain what it what it does because it is meant to save your time this toolkit will out of the box provide you support to spin up a brand new temporal enable cluster and has comprehensive readme that you should read to make the setup process even easier now let's say this this will help you build temporal on ecs from scratch but let's say you are already working with ecs you have your applications running on ecs but you have temporal running somewhere else and now you are finding a way to get temporal inside your ecs ecosystem this toolkit will this toolkit will again help you over there so as i said readme is the place to go and for or if you have any uh, like if you need any help or assistance you can always reach out to us uh, at hello@wednesday.is quickly talking about how this toolkit works so you can see a command on your screen yeah that's it it will take in few parameters that will be used by the by internally to create your cluster with proper naming conventions and it will give you a url so that url will be a basically a load balancer url and uh, you go there and you see a temporal ui that is running on ecs so you have your ecs de temporal ec deployed on ecs <clears throat> now that we have a temporal services running and tested let us discuss the considerations for making this a production ready system deploying an application or service to a production is a critical step and there are many factors to consider before making the move some of these factors include the ability to handle load the ability to scale up and down intelligently based on various factors such as cpu or memory utilization and others a proper monitoring system in place to identify and troubleshoot issues that your application is going through with regards to how the current system can be made production ready the first step is to determine the database size the open source cluster size and the cpu and memory requirements for the ecs task based on the expected traffic now here with this doesn't mean that you should restrict your services to be to at a specific level of traffic we always want as many as possible as many people as possible to use the applications which is where auto scaling comes in you will need to set up a Oh, um, yeah. So you need to set up a proper auto scaling mechanism so that the services can scale up and scale down as needed. This will ensure that ECS automatically set like spins up or adjusts the number of tasks to maintain the performance of your application. This will also make your application highly available during the peak uses and scale down accordingly. That will save you money. Uh, did I mention that the toolkit also supports auto scaling? You can also add additional conditions by just referring to the AWS Copilot documentations. we will discuss how to monitor your system effectively in the next slide but now it's time for a small demo like no technical webinar is complete without a demo and you'll agree with me that no demo is complete without failing at least once but don't worry we don't we won't see a experimental demo that will fail i had planned to do a live demo due to time constraints i have recorded a demo which will obviously play at 4x and that shows how load testing can be done and how the auto scaling can be handled so on this screen uh, i'll just play it So here you you are seeing a demo that's happening. So what are we looking at is 
the latest of my application. I already have an application that is running, uh, and so and also Temporal is running on ECS. I have set up auto scaling to scale up when memory utilization goes or exceeds twenty percent. I know that twenty percent is quite low and not ideal to be used as an scaling indicator, but this is for the demo purpose. As I mentioned, like you can always change the parameters referring to the copilot documentations. I, I have used K6 tools to load test my application. And on the screen, right, you saw uh, the the load test happening. Then we saw the workflow that was the workflows that, that were running. And then now we are seeing the CloudWatch memory matrix. So in the CloudWatch memory matrix, we, we see two alarms being present. And both the alarms are in the state of OK. So both the alarm states, my scaling matrix. So when, when my system will hit 20% or more, memory utilization will be 20% and more for, uh, for almost three minutes, my one alarm will go from OK to in alarm state. The moment my alarm goes into in alarm status, ECS will now, like right now we see it, it, it is in OK, but the moment it go, uh, goes into in alarm status, ECS will spin up another task and that will help balance the load. Yeah, so right now we are seeing that this is in alarm and in uh, the co-pilot, like ECS has now spinned up another task. So now I have two tasks running. And eventually we'll see when the task comes up, right? The, we'll see the memory uh, like memory utilization going down. So we have three metrics over here. The memory utilization is minimum, maximum, and average. So you'll see a drop. Yeah, so this is the drop that I was talking about. So this is the drop when you, you'll see when you have multiple tasks. So this, is, this was a very basic application. And uh, that's the reason like uh, we I kept it 20 percent, but like you can always manipulate those things. All right. So now that we have seen the demo right, and similar to the scaling up, I as I discussed, we had two alarms. So the second alarm will trigger when my system when the load on my system is less than 20 percent and uh, the scaling down will happen. So it will scale down the task that was created. Now that we have seen how to handle load and scale our services accordingly. Let us quickly see how we can leverage the AWS ecosystem to help us maintain and manage our applications properly. As we discussed, like there are a number of important considerations to take like, to keep in mind when taking an application from like application from development or any other stage to production, including load handling, scaling, and monitoring. But fortunately, AWS makes it easy to monitor your systems using CloudWatch. CloudWatch provides a wide range of monitoring metrics and alarms which can be used to track the health and performance of your application. The way we saw it in the demo, right? But it has like a lot more to offer. In addition to CloudWatch, we can also use other AWS services to enhance the applications monitoring and management capabilities. For example, we can use S3 buckets, like we can use S3 storage to store workflow related data. And it's like data could be such like large files or logs, and then, then the data can be accessed by temporal as and when needed. Amazon X-Ray is another useful tool for monitoring and tracing our application, like application distributed system. So X-Ray provides a detailed view of like how request flows from, uh, from like in, inside your application, how the request flows. The X-Ray, X-Ray will provide you a detailed view about it. And as I again say, like X-Ray setting up X-Ray is quite easy with Copilot. You just need to have the observability section in your manifest and you'll have to set tracing is equal to like tracing the value for tracing will have to set as AWS XRIP. More on that, you can uh, re always refer like uh, the, the documentations. By leveraging the AWS ecosystem, we can build a highly scalable, reliable and well monitored application. Like this is this will help us to ensure that our application can meet the demands of a user and to quickly identify and resolve like issues that may occur. We can also use AWS chatbot, the which uh, or you can use SNS along with CloudWatch, so it, it will send you uh, mails and uh, like messages on like you can have integration with Slack or chat. on Slack you can have AWS chatbot app and it will send you messages. So there are a lot of possibilities that can be done while using AWS. Yeah. So wow, I like can't, can't believe we are about to end my session over here. So that was a super productive discussion. We to have a quick summary and key takeaways, right? Key what we discussed. So we began by like defining AWS ECS and discussing the challenges that came uh, when when we were deploying Temporal on ECS. We then saw the architecture of Temporal flow and how to build it using the AWS best practices. Next, we explored the different ways to deploy Temporal on ECS, including the Temporal ECS standard kit. Uh, we then moved one step by it and looked at how to make the system production ready. We discussed load testing and auto scaling and how these features can be 
help like to ensure the system to handle real world traffic finally we discussed how the aws system can be leveraged to enhance your system we looked at how aws cloudwatch can be used to monitor the system and how other aws services can be integrated to provide additional functionality we also discuss about few more possibilities like with s3 and x-ray but it was just a part of it the like aws ecosystem is quite huge and can be integrated in a lot of possible ways maybe a topic for our next discussion yeah so i think i covered it quite quickly but uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time and i hope ki you found this discussion a informative and helpful thank you for your time and for patiently listening to what i had said and this is the time we convert this session into a conversation uh, you can ask me questions i'll definitely try to answer them if i'm not able to do it right now we can have a discussion over that on my linkedin or if you if you have any if you need any expert help or you can definitely reach out to us at hello at that venice dot is so yeah uh, that was it and over to you lauren like if you have questions yeah we have one from maya are you running these tasks with fargate or ec2 yeah so we are using a uh, fargate to run the task compared to ec2 we prefer using fargate as uh, talking from the cost perspective also fargate are like quite uh, less uh, they provide you like they are cheaper than ec2 and easy to spin up what database are you running in rds any thoughts on running cassandra with key spaces so on rds we are using postgres and sql postgres sql uh, we haven't i haven't explored on cassandra but uh, i think postgres sql does the work quite efficiently we have just kept uh, for temporal we are using postgres sql for application we might uh, uh, use mysql as well but that depends up, up, like according on the requirement uh, what are your thoughts on leveraging ecs sidecar containers to deploy temporal probably using server as the main container and other services like ui history as sidecar containers yeah it could be a it could be a good option to explore uh, like having the main servers on uh, the main container and uh, having ui and, uh, like history as a sidecar container it could be a good option to i haven't explored it but it would be a uh, we can give it a try because uh, anyways ui won't have that load and we won't need a main attract main containers to be allocated to it it can be used as a sidecar so it's just a good thought or good good try to give how is postgres handling the search actions per second for uh, we like as i said we are using open search right for the indexing and purpose so we are not directly using postgres to handling the search actions so all the uh, searching will be done using uh, open search and we will be doing the schema setups like you can go through the readme we have mentioned over the schema setups and the files so they are quite self explanatory so you will you'll have a good idea over that uh, would you mind sharing like a your screen looking at the the repo and maybe giving an overview of the different parts of it sure give me a second <clears throat> uh, i hope it's visible yep yeah. so i'll just go to the readme uh or maybe uh, so uh, uh, as i discussed right the setup temporal script is the one that will uh, always set you uh, that's the one click solution that we we are talking about and what happens inside it is uh, i'll just open that and see so <clears throat> initially we have uh, so copilot needs multiple things right the add-ons and manifest files at the server uh, it it, uh, it is basically based on the manifest files so we have created a base folder over here which has the manifest files in place right and uh, we are using this manifest file so as i was talking about database cluster right we have we have the manifest file created uh, similarly for open source we have a manifest file created over here and what we do uh, what the setup temporal script does is it will it will take few parameters from you and then it will create the copilot folder it will create the copilot folder with everything the add-ons the services and it will have the proper structure and once the folders are created now now it's the time that it will initialize that application initialize the application along with the service that you give the name so if you see the readme again right 
so in read uh, to run the script this says ki this needs a server name ui name and an environment name so basically copilot will take this name the, the script will take this name create a folder structure and then the, it will run the copilot deploy application so once the copilot deploy is done right based on the environment name that you've given it will create a environment over there and uh, it will it will around take like 15 to 20 minutes and post that right this this describes about how the uh, script works and post that it will be uh, easier to like you have temporal over there and also uh, i forgot to discuss about this like we uh, when you are using the application inside like when you have temporal and your your and your application inside the ecs right you can use the service discovery that that copilot provides right so service discovery can be used to uh, uh, link to your application then there you, you won't need the any uh, endpoints or something you can just use service discovery and it, it is quite simple url it is just service name dot your environment name your app name and that dot local and then you can have the 7233 port and you can start workflows over there right and then there is again another section which describes how you can deploy to existing ecs cluster this considers that you have deployed using copilot and for uh, again for auto scaling we have uh, just so uh, server dot manifest file right this in the base server dot manifest file is the file that you should uh, refer to or you, maybe you can go through it it's a quite self explanatory file so this file sets up the main uh, the temporal server and how it happens is from the docker file maybe you can give it a, a like a readme well again it's a good readme so i think readme should help can i choose different um uh, like auto scale thresholds for different services yeah yeah, yeah. you can definitely choose uh, auto uh, different auto scale for your different services in just manifest you have to there's a count section you just uh, have the counts uh, the way you want right and um how much can i configure like can i can i choose the number of uh, shards to start out with uh, you can you can uh, configure that but in the database so i haven't configured that but you will have to uh, go through the copilot documentation if it provides out of the box if no then you can, we can have something from cloud formation and add it over there okay right. but where where is like um uh say dynamic config so uh, dynamic configuration yeah like um i guess um i'm curious are there other places where you're where you're choosing how many uh pods to start out with for each service uh how many ports to start off yeah so th this you see the count over here right uh, now yes. i've kept it as one so that that's uh, what like uh, if you are comparing ports with eks then this is how uh, this will start off your task in ecs okay yeah. all right Thanks a lot, Bavesh, for Thank presenting. You. That was a, yeah. a great Thank talk. Um, yeah, I hope it was helpful. Definitely. And, and thank you to everyone for attending. And we will see you next month. Uh, we're doing this every, every last Tuesday of the month. Uh, so see you in September or earlier at Replay in Seattle.